I would just like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Kristen Lodge. I'm the Director of Development and Communications here at the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center. Um, our mission at the museum is to engage and educate the Wenatchee Valley community. You might think of exhibits or artifacts when you think about museums, but our museum also serves as a community forum, a place where you can meet with your neighbors, where you can learn about issues that are important to our community, and where you can discuss your thoughts and opinions. While we're not able to gather um, physically at our museum right now, we are able to gather virtually in forums like this to inspire engagement. Our goal today is to cultivate conversation around the most pressing issue in our community right now, which is COVID-19. We're tasked as a community to stay safe and stay home now, but we know that will continue to change in the coming weeks and months. And when we do venture out, we wanna make sure that we're keeping ourselves and others safe. This Q&A session is designed to provide information from our local health experts on masking guidelines in our community, on donation efforts, and on construction and sewing methods. Today, you'll get to hear from Dr. Doug Wilson, Chief Executive Officer Elect of Confluence Health, and Dr. Jason Lake, Chief Medical Officer Elect of Confluence Health. Thank you both for joining us. Thank Our you. pleasure. They'll be sharing information on current research around coronavirus, community impact statistics, response efforts from our local healthcare community, and they'll be discussing masking policies. We'll let Dr. Wilson and Dr. Lake share information with us first, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Today, we're also joined by Connie Morris, a community sewing expert. Thanks for joining us, Connie. Happy to be here. Connie will answer questions you have around mass construction, supplies, and methods, um, including tie method, elastic method, and no sew mask versions. Please feel free throughout the conversation today to use your Q&A button on your screen. If you're on a desktop, that button is on the bottom of your screen. If you're on a mobile device, I believe that button is on the top of your screen. Um, you can use the Q&A button or chat to submit questions and to talk with the panelists and attendees. Um, I'll be on hand today to moderate the session. I'll be keeping track of your questions in the Q&A session um, on chat and on email, and I'll make sure those questions get answered and pose them to the panelists. Um, so first, I just wanna thank you again for joining us. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Wilson to kick off the conversation. Dr. Wilson, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much, Kristen. Are we live? Yes, we are. It's, um, it's a real pleasure. I, I, I really appreciate everyone who's taking time to, uh, to let us talk for a few minutes about this. And, uh, you know, I just thinking about how things are closed and everything's different, the museum's closed down. And I personally am a real uh, fan of the arts and culture, and it's it's one of the things that's been hard the last several weeks. So um, it's, I'm just going to pretend this is sort of a virtual trip to the museum, and uh, try to enjoy the few minutes we have together that way. Um, and you know, firstly, I, I want to thank um, everyone who's tuning into this for the efforts you've made. Um, I'm aware that everybody has been really impacted by this pandemic situation over the past several weeks, and I think this group in particular is a group of people who are interested in, in doing something about it. And I'm actually aware of many of you who've already uh, spent your time and talents making masks. And uh, that's really important. So that's why Dr. And Lake and I are here today. And uh, um, it, he'll talk more about the, uh, the masks in particular and sort of why they're important. Uh, but what I'd like to do is, just take a minute or two to update you all about um, what Confluence Health has been doing in response to the pandemic um, and, um, and kind of what our priorities are going forward. So as you, as you know, um, um, Washington State was one of the first states to start getting, well, was the first state to get a, a case diagnosed in, in the United States. And um, shortly after that, before, in fact, any cases were diagnosed in our area, um, Confluence Health activated what's called our Hospital Incident Command Structure, or HICS system. And that 
really sort of um, took control of all of Confluence's operations to make us really very single-minded in our effort to prepare for what we were very concerned could be an overwhelming number of, of COVID cases like we'd seen happen in other places like Italy and New York City. So it really changed uh, what we did here and, um, and it sort of reprioritized a lot of things, but it also allowed us to look, take a look at, at our, our priorities that we always have. For instance, we're always focused on safety and quality of care for our patients. And now that just has become, has taken a new meaning, which is we want to be sure that um, our, our patients are safe if they have to come into our facilities, our employees are safe when they come to work, and that we're doing everything we can to keep our community safe by, say, uh, changing how we use waiting rooms and things like that. So as we move into this next phase, we're going to um, be discovering and we're going to be learning more about COVID and, and its impact on the community and the world. And we're going to be um, uh, adapting all the knowledge that's out there and that we're discovering uh, to change how we do things internally. So I'm just going to go through uh, for a minute some of the things that we have done already before we get into how important masking is for uh, our safety plan going into, into the next few weeks. Um, so some of the things that we really um, uh, did initially was we set up a COVID hotline. You probably know this 663-8711 number where um, um, you, any, anybody in the region can call and find out if they need to be tested for COVID and how they would go about that. They can also schedule appointments through that uh, number. And of course, the next thing we did was we rolled out virtual visits so that many of the physicians are able to see patients um, through a video link uh, using MyChart or another application or also by phone. And uh, by calling this number, you get a central uh, person who can help you uh, set up an appointment if you need it. We, we had to postpone partly on the order of the governor of the state of Washington all non-essential visits and elective procedures. And so that really brought our um, hospitals uh, kind of to uh, a much lower level of activity. Um, we, uh, we had to restrict how we, used, how we let visitors into our facilities. Uh, and uh, we had to create childcare plans for our staff because uh, uh, that became a, a big issue as soon as the schools were um, closed. Uh, we also uh, very rapidly opened up a drive-through testing facility you've probably heard about, uh, both in here and then later up in OMAC um, at our Emerson Street facility. And um, we've created a rapid response team that uh, can work with our partners who run assisted livings and nursing homes because we really wanted to uh, help them to take advantage of all the latest knowledge about how to use protective equipment and screening procedures to keep those facilities very safe. Um, so we've done a lot of outreach um, with other organizations. Um, meanwhile, we, and Dr. Lake was responsible for a lot of this, I should add, uh, we created a plan to utilize not just Central Washington Hospital, but also potentially Wenatchee Valley Hospital to be able to con uh, contain and house if we, all the patients that would come to us if we indeed had a really large surge of, of patients. And that included even remodeling some space at Central Washington Hospital. A hospital so that we could we could even have new rooms uh, made available in some of the space that wasn't previously used for patients. So throughout throughout this uh, process our, our strategy has been to sort of plan for the worst and hope for the best and we really have been very grateful at, at the the response our community has taken the seriousness with which they've taken uh, the community has taken the governor's recommendations and, and the recommendations of other authorities to socially distance, physically distance, uh, close a lot of businesses, which is a really gut-wrenching decision with a lot of hardship 
to a lot of people. But what, what we believe we're seeing is that it's really starting to work. Um, as a consequence, that overwhelming surge did not uh, materialize, at least so far. And we're hopeful that this trend will turn into a plateau. Um, currently, we have about seven patients with COVID in Central Washington Hospital. Of that uh, total, four of those patients are, are critically ill in the ICU on ventilators. And, um, and the rest are uh, in the lower level of, of care where they're not needing the ventilator. We've sent several patients home after recovering. And so we're very proud of, of the care that we've provided these patients. Meanwhile, we have done a lot of things internally that, that you wouldn't know about. We've put up artificial walls in the intensive care unit with new doors to separate the clean area from the patients uh, who are suspected or may have COVID so that we can keep uh, caring for all the people who come in for other things that are important and make sure they're safe, as safe as possible. Um, in terms of the testing we've done, uh, we've tested roughly 2,200 patients so far, and about 189 of those have been confirmed positive. So over 1,990 of those have been negative. We have a few tests always still out at the laboratory waiting to come back. Uh, in Chelan and Douglas counties, where of course most of our population is, we've had 172 confirmed cases. Most of those patients did not need to come to the hospital. Um, we've had 100 confirmed cases in Chelan and 72 cases in Douglas County. And we have so far had six uh, people unfortunately pass away from uh, this infection. So uh, what's next? Um, it looks, again, like social distancing is really paying off. I really have to give it, uh, give a good hand and appreciation to our community. I don't think I could say that enough, uh, the thankfulness that I am, uh, that our community members have taken this seriously. It, you have undoubtedly saved lives of community members. I think you have also prevented that overwhelming surge that could have overwhelmed hospital resources and could frankly have threatened uh, the health of our our very own healthcare workers. So we really are really grateful it's looking like this. And the question is, how do we move forward into the next weeks and months uh, until this, hopefully this episode will eventually pass and we'll go back to something that looks like normal. But meanwhile, we're confronting a period of time that we're not sure how long it'll last where, where normal is going to look like wearing masks and it's going to look like maybe going to some businesses, but keeping our distance. It's gonna look like a lot more hand sanitizer and hand washing. Um, so so um, as we start to think about that, you know, this, this leads into what, um, what Dr. Lake's gonna talk about. Uh, but I really wanna thank all of you um, for your incredible work, your support and, uh, and um, and your understanding as we work through this. Uh, I guess the final thing I'd say is that uh, if I didn't make it clear, um, going into this longer um, phase, just as we considered during the initial phase preparing for a surge, our, our primary goal this whole time is to, is to keep people safe. This is all about keeping the community as healthy as it can be, minimizing the spread of COVID, keeping people inside businesses and especially our healthcare facilities as safe as possible so that when people need to feel, need to seek care for whatever reason, they, they really feel like they can have confidence that we're keeping them as safe as possible and uh, that they'll be better off seeking care when they need it. So I think that's it. I'm looking forward to questions. I'm really looking forward to the work of this group. Uh, so I'll stay tuned and listen while Dr. Lake uh, uh, gives us some more information. Dr. Wilson, thanks for joining us today. Mm, my pleasure. Uh, we do have a few questions, um, but I think we'd, let's hear from Dr. Lake first, and then we'll open up to some of the questions that we're seeing come in. Dr. Lake, thanks for being with us. Great. Thanks, Kristen, and, and thanks, Dr. Wilson. Um, I don't have a lot to add, but I really want to echo um, the gratitude to our community. Um, 
the community has really helped us in many regards, not the least of which is their attention to, to social, social distancing. You really have saved lives and you've made our ability as a health system and a health community able to um, deal with the amount of COVID that we've had because we've been able to avoid a surge. Um, we also wanna thank you for the incredible um, gifts we've received in terms of the masks that have already been made. Our focus throughout this entire um, crisis um, from the beginning has been on personal protective equipment or PPE. And we really need the medical grade PPE in the areas of the hospital where we treat our COVID patients. Um, but as most of you know, there's a shortage of PPE um, throughout the region and throughout the state and throughout the country. Um, so it became fairly apparent early on that we were going to rely on cloth face coverings, both in the community and, and in some parts of our healthcare organization um, to be able to get through this crisis. And the community has already responded um, with enormous generosity in, in donating these masks. And we're now entering the next phase of, of health care um, over the next week or two, we fully expect that we'll be able to slowly start expanding um, the health services that we provide to the community so that we can get the, the patients and community members that need essential care back into our system. But we're going to rely on masks. We need to make sure as um, as the foot traffic through our facilities starts to increase a little bit, that we take every effort to um, continue social distancing, which was very easy when there weren't many people coming into our facilities. But healthcare doesn't always allow social distancing. So there is there are gonna be periods of time where we have to come in closer contact or close proximity with people. And in those cases, masks are gonna be very important. Um, and we don't have enough medical grade masks to mask everyone that come into our facility. So we're really going to rely on cloth masks donated from the community. So um, we appreciate the efforts of everyone on this call and everyone in the community that have already donated and are willing to donate more. And we really know that the cloth masks, what they do is they protect other people from us. There are some of us um, in the community that may be walking around um, that that have COVID, but we haven't developed symptoms yet, or maybe we'll never develop symptoms. And those people sometimes can transmit that infection to other people unknowingly. And we know that this virus is transmitted predominantly through droplets. So little um, spit particles essentially that come out as we cough or as we sneeze, or even as we talk in close proximity. And these and these masks stop that from coming out of our mouths. So they protect the people around us. Um, so by wearing masks, we really protect the community. Um, and we're gonna be dependent on these masks as we move forward. So we appreciate your willingness to uh, hold this town hall and the willingness of the participants, uh, participants on this call to, um, to help in this effort. Um, and we really have, you know, we brought a couple, we have different style masks that have been donated from the community. Um, and, and they're all great. And we even have some masks that not only use um, cloth from home, um, but we have some uh, blue material from our uh, surgical supplies that, have, uh, that we've supplied the Confluence Health Foundation with that folks can pick up that blue surgical cloth from the foundation um, in order to, to sew those masks. Um, all the mask donations do go through the foundation. So we encourage you to visit their website um, and to coordinate with them. Um, and then they can make sure those masks get distributed appropriately throughout our organization. Um, but I'm very appreciative of all that you do. And I guess at, that, at this point, I can open it up to questions if you're ready for that. Absolutely. Thank you all for submitting questions. Um, I have questions that have come in through our email. Um, I'm also monitoring chat and the Q&A button. I want to remind you that you're all invited to um, participate and submit your questions um, uh, via the Q&A button or via the chat button. Um, we do have a question here about people who have been um, socially isolating and how soon we anticipate it will be safe to get together and how to stay safe once we are able to. 
I think that, um, like Dr. Wilson mentioned a bit ago, I think we are going to enter a period of time, and we don't exactly know the duration of that time, but I suspect it'll be many months, if not a year or a year and a half, um, where we start to ease the social restrictions, but we do it in a very thoughtful way. Um, and the ways that we keep ourselves safe um, really go back to the basics of infection control. Um, we do great hand hygiene. If we touch a surface that someone has coughed on um, and then touch our face, we can accidentally infect ourselves. So um, really good hand hygiene, good cleaning of high touch surfaces, um, and probably some component of masking will be involved in our social interactions um, in the future just to keep, um, to keep others around us safe. Um, so I don't know exactly when that'll happen. I suspect states, um, some already are, and our state probably will in the near future start easing some of the social restrictions, but I think it'll be slow and I think it'll be gradual. And I don't think we'll get back to a place where we were in January or February um, anytime in the near future. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions about mass in general. Um, for example, how much protection does a mask provide? What is an N95 mask? And are cloth masks as effective um, as medical masks? Can the doctor speak to those? Great questions. Um, so the N95 respirators are the, are the highest medical grade masks that we have. Um, and really the filtration system in those N95 respirators uh, are um, significant enough that they actually filter out virus particles. Um, so they are used in the highest risk situations. So when some of our staff are going into the rooms that have patients that we know have COVID and they're doing procedures on them that are likely um, to result in um, dissemination of some of these virus particles, they really need those high quality N95 masks to keep them safe. Um, and there are some other respirators that can also keep them safe. Um, medical grade um, masks or mouth coverings like, like you would see someone wear in surgery um, also have a finer filtration than a, than a cloth mask. Um, so they are a little bit more effective. The cloth masks, however, are quite effective at catching those droplet particles that leave our uh, mouth or to a lesser extent, our nose. Um, so when you take a mask like this that um, has, has two layers of cloth in it um, and it's a pretty tight weave cotton um, for droplet particles to escape our mouth and get through that mask, it becomes unlikely that that'll happen. So these are actually pretty effective um, at eliminating the droplet um, exhaust from, from our mouth and nose. Um, so in the community, cloth masks, and in some parts even of our health system, cloth masks are, are very effective at stopping those droplets. Thank you. Um, we also have a question about uh, using masks for people who wear glasses. People are having issues where their glasses are fogging up from the boots on the ground, do you have any um, tips or tricks for us that could help prevent that? Really what caused the, the fogging on the glasses is, um, is when there's not a tight seal around the top of the nose and underneath the eye, some of that humidified air that we um, exhale goes up and fogs our glasses. So the best thing you can do to avoid that is to try to get a good seal um, at, the, at the bridge of the nose and under the eyes. Um, short of that, it's, it's, it, it can be tough because that is a problem with people that, that have glasses, but just try to get that as good of a seal at the top of the mask as possible. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take a moment to hear from Connie Morris. Connie is a community sewing expert. Um, she'll be able to answer questions that um, people have around mass construction, supplies, and um, methods. Um, Connie, would you like to say a few words and then I can um, help field some of the questions we're seeing around mass construction? Um, yes, I would like to say that I'm happy to be able to participate in the community this way by donating my time making masks for 
family, friends, and the Community Foundation. Thank you. Wonderful. So we're seeing questions, Connie, um, about uh, layers and materials. Um, and maybe this is a question for Connie and a question for the doctors. As we, as we look to create masks ourselves, um, can you tell us about the best materials to use for that construction? Well, the best material is a very tight weave cotton, 100% cotton. I have been making masks uh, based on uh, the recommendation from, uh, I worked, made masks for DOCO um, a couple of weeks ago, and they preferred a three layered uh, construction plan. So I do three layers of 100% with my Titus weave cotton. Luckily, I have a lot of scraps in my sewing closet. So I've been uh, using some of that material up that I've had around for many, many years. Thank you, Connie. Um, we're having some, we're getting some questions about people who are unable to find some supplies for mass construction. There's a lot of great tutorials out there um, and some tips and tricks for how to construct masks. We've shared those on the museum's website, um, and they're, they're listed on the Confluence Foundation site as, whether, as well as uh, their local um, sewing sites. Can you tell us a little bit about um, when we can't find elastic, what some of the other options are for mass construction? Uh, well, you can use seam binding. Um, and again, I had these in my personal stash. This is a little bit wide. So in this case, I would fold it over and make it smaller for a tie. Um, you can also use, people are using hair ties for the no sew mask. Um, I, you could use ribbon. Uh, this is another type of, of seam binding that you could use for a tie. So elastic is very difficult to find. Personally, I have not been in search of it because I have a good friend, Shelly Finch, who has sewn a lot of masks for the community and, and various organizations who has been getting elastic for me. Thank you, Connie. Um, as we do wear masks, and perhaps this question is for the doctors, um, is it safe to get closer than six feet away when we are wearing a mask? best policy is to continue to try to maintain social distancing of, of six feet when possible, even if you are wearing a mask. Um, brief encounters um, at closer distances are sometimes necessary as we go throughout our business or as we go shopping in the, in the grocery stores. Um, but I would try not to make a habit of, of getting much closer than that. Um, and this may also be a good time to, to say that sometimes when people are wearing masks, there's a tendency to fidget with it or touch it quite a bit. And, um, and sometimes it takes a lot of practice to resist the urge to do that. Um, similarly, when you're taking, on, uh, taking off or putting on a mask, try not to touch the, the front of the mask or the inside of the mask and really just touch the ear loops or the side of the mask um, just to avoid any possible contamination if, if there is any. Um, and then lastly, I would say it's important to launder these masks um, daily. So I, I wouldn't recommend using these masks for several days without, without laundering them. Um, so I just wanted to throw out those tips as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's very helpful. On the question of laundering, um, can you talk about the difference uh, between cleaning and disinfecting or sterilizing and, and the best method used for, for washing our masks? Yeah, just washing them in the regular um, laundry cycle is adequate to, to get rid of this virus on the mask. Um, so there are some um, higher tech medical ways to decontaminate masks, but, um, but you don't have to worry about doing any of those um, with these cloth-based masks. Um, the N95 respirators that we use in the hospital, um, those can't be laundered. Um, so sometimes we do use a decontamination process with UV light to decontaminate those. But um, for everyone at home, just launder these like you would launder the regular, your regular clothes in the laundry and that's adequate. And Dr. Lake, will you remind me, how often do we wash our masks? I'd wash it at least once a day if, if you're wearing it. Um, yeah, at least once a day. Okay. Um, 
Can you tell us about mask use? Should we wear a mask anytime we go outside um, or only when we're indoors with people other than our family? I would say you should wear a mask when, when you're um, not confident that you're going to be able to adequately socially distance for the entire period of time. Um, and I do think that would probably apply to um, having individuals over in your house um, if you thought that there were going to be periods of time where you were closer than six feet, or even if, even if you think you are going to maintain that six feet, wearing a mask um, is, is probably a good idea. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about children and masks? Um, and perhaps this question is both for the doctors and for Connie, as we talk about trying to size our mask to child size um, faces. I think I'll let Connie talk about the um, how to size a mask appropriately for that. You don't want to take a stab at it? <laughs> no, thanks. Um, well, my adult size, I cut uh, a piece nine inches by seven inches for the body of the mask. For a child size, and I was not prepared to actually answer this question, I would say you would take at least an inch off of each side, so maybe seven inches by five inches. So two inches. And then the elastic, uh, this is seven inches. I would change that to five inches. Thank you. And mask use for children. Yes, I was going to turn I, that. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to add. Um, the CDC recommends that we don't mask children under the age of two or children with any respiratory symptoms. So if someone is um, having problems with their asthma or something, um, it's, it's not recommended to mask those children. Thank you. Um, we're getting some questions about filters, and I think some of this might be a construction question and some of it might be a question for the doctors. Um, we have some people using different types of interfacing or trying to build pockets. Um, do we need a filter and what is the best filter material? I would have the doctor answer that. <laughs> I would say filters in, in cloth masks are really not necessary. Um, the, um, the air that we exhale really is filtered by the cloth. And, and if you use a double layer, like Connie was mentioning, a triple layer mask, the filtration that happens just traveling through those layers of cotton um, is adequate to get most of those droplets um, out, of the, out of the air that we exhale. So um, additional filtration systems, I think, are probably not necessary. We're seeing a lot of questions about mask wearing outdoors. Is it important to wear a mask when we're outside? I think um, I think when we're in public it's it's safe it's it's smart to wear a mask. Um, sometimes when we're out jogging or on a bike ride and we don't intend to encounter other people, I think it's probably okay not to not to wear a mask. But um, if there's any time that we think we might encounter uh, other people, um, I think we should just anticipate that and, and wear a mask during those occasions. Thank you. We have some questions about comfort too. Someone saying, let's acknowledge this. This is really uncomfortable to wear a mask, particularly probably for people who aren't used to doing it and who are needing to wear it for long, long periods of times. Um, I've been hearing some things about, you know, rubbing uh, behind the ears. Um, I know that there might be some tips and tricks out there to help with comfort. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I would say the ties would eliminate the issue uh, for irritation behind the ears. Um, using a very, uh, small elastic. This we ran out of our three eighths inch elastic or our quarter inch elastic, so we made some with three eighths inch, and these will probably be a little more uncomfortable than the quarter inch. And they do make a one eighth inch elastic, which is quite similar to the uh, density of a uh, regular uh, medical mask that I wear at my job in dentistry. Um, and that would probably be a lot more comfortable. But ultimately, to avoid the irritation, um, you the, construct your mask with a tie. And when I make the 
ties, I make a 17 inch for the top piece and a 14 inch for the bottom piece. The, um, the loops with, uh, on the elastic masks are certainly a lot more convenient. I've made people tie masks and then they've asked me to um, make, create an elastic ear mask. But um, if, you, if you have an issue with it, I would then go to the mask with the tie. Thank you. Um, I've heard people who are um, using 3D printers to print um, a, a, a piece they can wrap the elastic around in the back. Are you seeing that in the hospitals? Someone was saying their son who's a nurse is wearing um, one of those barrel of monkey monkeys to connect the elastic in the back, back of his mask. Yes, I have I heard about people using those. I haven't, I haven't seen it specifically, but um, maybe Connie has some more information. I've, I've seen the devices on Facebook. Um, another thing that's softer than the elastic too, some people are using t-shirts. So they're, they're cutting the seven inch piece out of a, a one inch piece of t-shirt material. So it would be a lot softer because if you feel elastic, you know, it has the of the rubber and the ridges in it and uh, it might be less irritating. I have not done any of that, uh, but I hear people are having good results from that. Uh, I would think that it would over time stretch out more than the elastic. The elastic would maintain its integrity, especially if you're taking it on and off. Thank you. I'd love to come back to that in just a minute. I'm seeing some, que some questions about supply and donations. Um, people are wanting to know if there is a shortage of masks at the hospital, how many masks are needed, and if you're still accepting donations. That's a great question. We absolutely are accepting um, donations. Part of the problem as we've gone through this um, pandemic is the inability to predict the future. So um, we currently have adequate um, an adequate supply of medical grade masks, um, but we also like to try to keep some in reserve um, in case there's a larger COVID outbreak in the weeks or months ahead. Um, so we, we do like to limit our medical grade masks to those in our organization that, that need those for medical grade purposes. And for everyone else, we'd really like to, to utilize the cloth-based masks. Um, so this is one area where we truly are interdependent on each other. Um, we want to take great care of the um, people in our community, but in turn, you guys are taking great care of us by continuing to make those masks and donate them to our foundation, because I really do think that we're going to be reliant on those donations um, for some time ahead. So we really appreciate it. We really um, are in need of continued donations, and you can coordinate that through the Confluence Health Foundation. Thank you. Um, can you clarify if you need donations of N95s and cloth masks or both? We really want the community to focus on cloth-based masks. I think that's going to be our largest demand over the coming months. Um, our current inventory of N95s is um, adequate to take care of the patients that we anticipate we may need to take care of. Um, so we really want the community to focus on the cloth-based mask. That's what's most useful to us now and, and in the foreseeable future. Can you tell me where the donations should go? Yeah, the Confluence Health Foundation, I think um, their uh, address is 518 North Chelan Avenue, and they're open from 8.30 in the morning to 4 p.m. Um, and I'll read off their phone number, 509 436 six two seven five um, and and they coordinate uh, the collection of the masks and then the distribution to our um, to our facility thank you Connie we have some questions about people who don't have sewing machines but they're looking to make masks at home do you have any tips for us for no sew masks well there is um one that I've seen, and this is just a regular bandana that is folded in half and then half again, depending on the size of your face. Of course, you, you can size it to your face and get an idea. So you, you fold it twice and then you fold the outside 
pull the outside to the center. Again, checking the size for your particular face. And then take a hair tie and for one side of it, and then that works perfectly adequate to, to cover and to retain the droplets that you might express. Thank you. <laughs> um, this question, I believe, is for the doctors. Um, this comment is um, about attending uh, or uh, visits to local healthcare communities where they're observing the staff not wearing masks. You talked a little bit about the policy change coming up where um, the community visiting will be needing to wear masks. This question is specifically about um, how that policy might be changing internally as well and how you might be working to um, educate uh, your internal and external community. That's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, as as um, our outpatient clinic visits um, really tapered off through the through most of this crisis we're more we're able to adequately social distance in our clinics for the most part um, as we expect to slowly start expanding our clinical services that's going to become increasingly difficult um, so starting on Monday actually all of our staff and employees that are um, that are in our facilities in areas where patients are located um, and and where it's difficult to maintain social distancing, we'll be wearing a mask. Um, so as we've gone through this um, crisis through the last several weeks, um, we've really looked closely at our PPE protocols and practices based on our inventory and based on the guidelines from the scientific societies um, and made um, recommendations about what we should do internally based on all those factors. and coming up, I think, is, is another area of change when we are going to start um, making sure that all of our employees and staff in those areas where patients are located are wearing masks. And, and honestly, I think that that'll um, provide some level of um, comfort and trust in the patients that when they step into our facility and see those masked employees um, and they see our facilities, people cleaning our furniture, um, they can trust that they're coming into a safe environment because we really are focused on um, making our facilities or keeping our facilities safe for our, our patients and our employees um, and our staff and our providers. Um, so we modify our practices as we need to over time and that's one thing that we continue to look at. Thank you. Um, we have a specific question about construction that asked about um, whether or not fused fabric as a third layer is recommended. And I'm unfamiliar enough with sewing, I'm not even, I'm not even sure what that means. Well, the fused fabric is interfacing and I have, I have used it uh, in some cases, but I don't think it's necessary. You can just use that third layer of um, tight woven, tightly woven cotton. Thank you. Um, this, this question is probably for the doctors. Um, can you reuse disposable masks? And is there a way, if so, is there a way to sanitize them? The disposable ear loop masks should probably not be used for, for more than a day at a time. Um, when they get, more, they get wet, essentially, and they can't be laundered, um, the integrity of those masks starts to break down over time. So I typically do not recommend that people use those um, medical grade ear loop masks for more than one day at a time. Thank you. What about cloth masks? Um, how many uses can you get out of a cloth mask and are there um, construction techniques to improve longevity? And I'll let Connie uh, address the construction techniques from a medical standpoint, as long as the fabric um, remains intact um, with regular laundering, you can use those masks um, indefinitely as, as long as they're not breaking down. And there are probably some construction techniques um, that withstand those repeated episodes of laundering and I'll let Connie touch on those. Well, one thing I, I like to do is top stitch. After I have constructed the mass sewn the wrong sides of the fabric together. Then I, I top stitch 
over this, which will help seal those seams. And it will also um, provide a better uh, hold for the elastic. Uh, another thing, I don't dry my masks because um, the process of the, the heat in the dryer uh, does break down fabric over time. So I just hang, hang my mask to dry after I've washed them. Thank you. Um, Connie, I think this question is for you. Are you using pipe cleaners for a nose piece in your mask and do you have recommendations around that? I am not. Uh, I have not used anything in the construction to make that tighter over the nose. Uh, I know of people who are using pipe cleaners or um, garden wire. So um, I can't really speak to, to how that works. And for the doctors, is that uh, recommended as um, a way to improve fit or unnecessary? As long as most of the air that you exhale is going through the cloth and not around the edges, that's, that's adequate. So when a mask fits so loosely that there's a, an escape of air around the mask instead of through the fabric, um, that diminishes the, the usefulness of the, of the mask. So I, um, most of the masks that I've seen that have been donated to us have not used the pipe cleaners um, and yet they fit adequately. Um, so I think that is not necessary, but if it's more comfortable for someone or if that does solve the fogging while they're wearing glasses issue, then that might be a great option for some people. Thank you. Um, we have some questions about as it starts to get warm here in the summertime, um, some questions about skin reactions. Do you have any tips for avoiding heat related skin reactions? I personally don't. Yeah, this, this is new territory for us. Um, so I don't have a lot of mask wearing experience in the warmer months. Um, so I don't know if Connie's heard anything about that. Uh, in the mask making circles, but that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. It is a great question. Um, I would think using the 100% cotton uh, over a, a polyester uh, is going to be an advantage in the summer because it's softer and less irritating. Um, and I'm not sure if maybe once the summer months come, if we could construct two layer masks and they would be adequate. It sounds like um, after the conversation with um, Dr. Lake today that he thinks the two layer mask is enough. Um, so that might make it more comfortable as well. It, it would be less, um, it would be cooler than a three layer mask. Honey, we have a few requests coming in for you to demonstrate the masks that you've made. Would you be willing to try on the different masks that you have to show us how they work? Okay, so not demonstrate the construction, just demonstrate what they look like? Well, that's a good question. Um, it says demo the mask, and I'm seeing it from three different sources, but um, that's a very good question. Um, talk a little bit about um, the pleats and the construction as you... Okay, as you that. so as I showed you before, showed you before this is uh, a mask that I've turned inside out so I, I have sewn around the edges put the three layers of fabric together inserted the elastic in the corners I turn turn the mask and in this case I am doing masks with two different kinds of fabric so then you know which side you typically wear out, especially if, so for me, I take my mask with me when I go on my walks, just in case I encounter another person and I put the mask on if I get close to somebody. So I might not launder that in just that, because we're usually six feet apart. But so it's nice to know which side you wear out. Connie, I'm seeing that that mask isn't pleated, and some that I see are. What's the difference? Uh, this, the, that's the next step. Okay. The pleating. So then I would take this mask and uh, fold it. Here, I'll do it. It's kind of hard in this situation. I 
I take a tuck. So essentially you tuck it and I make my first tuck, the top tuck larger because it's gonna go over accordion over the bridge of the nose. So this, the depth of this first tuck is about uh, one and uh, three eighths inches. And the underside is tucked under about three eighths of an inch. So that's the first tuck. I pin it right here. And then I take the second tuck. Again, just because I make that one a little smaller, about three quarters of an inch. Take the second tuck, pin that. And then I think an important part, just so the construction um, stays uniform, is I iron it in this position. So then at that point is when I do the top stitching. I, I cut all right, so all along the edges, again, reinforcing that elastic so it, it will, uh, on the mini tugs, won't come out. And on the bottom, because I had to have a, a spot to turn the fabric inside and out, I fold that under, close the hole, and I stitch all the way around it. So in the end, the mask will look like this. And these fit quite snug over the nose. There is a little escape of air, but um, there you go. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of tips that people are sharing that I just want to share out loud here. Um, someone said that they've been asked to sew buttons on headbands to attach the elastic behind the ears and that keeps it from rubbing um, and irritation. Someone else really recommending that wire piece on the nose to keep glasses from fogging up. Um, and then Connie, a question for you, a follow up on the question about how to do kids sizing, um, a, a point that a five and a 10 year old would be a very different size. And, and I think a question, a question about how we might know that we're getting the right fit on them or how we might adjust that to them. Uh, well, I haven't done any uh, kids' mess uh, myself. Um, I did make uh, one for my granddaughter, who is 10. And I used the same 9-inch. I did, I did make it a little smaller. I, it was 6-inch, 9 by 6 instead of 9 by 7. Um, so I think you can just play with that if you're going to make them for your own children uh, and take two inches off the nine by seven and start there. Um, maybe for a younger child, I would take another inch off each side. But Thank for my 10 year old granddaughter, the nine by six fit fine. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about where to find fabric and supplies and if you can use your cotton bed sheets. I don't see why not. Um, I believe Joann's is still open. Uh, I have not been there since I have so many supplies in my sewing closet. Um, online, you could probably order things online. I'm not sure where Shelly's getting the elastic. Uh, I don't know what her resource for that is. So sorry, I'm not prepared to answer that well. Thank you. Dr. Sue had said something about the medical grade fabric. Where was that available and was that for people making donations for the hospital? That is, that's correct. So the foundation at that address that I gave you earlier at 518 North Chelan Avenue, um, they have some supply of that, that um, blue OR or operating room fabric that they can distribute out um, to people to make masks that can then be donated. Great. Thank you. Um, I believe that is uh, concluding the questions that I've received online, but I'd like to give people just a minute to um, add any additional questions that they might have coming in. Um, the museum will continue to share resources on our website. Um, someone's pointing out that there's great patterns for kids' masks on the fabric patch website. 
we'll share that link on our um, on our website um, and we'll continue to put those on Facebook as well um, any other questions I'm going to give just a minute and I'll invite Connie and Dr. Lake and Dr. Wilson. Are there any closing comments that you might have that you'd like to share? Connie, I actually have a question. How long does it take you start to finish to make a mask? Um, since I usually make them in bulk, I do them about 20 at a time. Uh, it takes me two hours to do 20. Okay. So I guess you could divide that up, yeah. but I'm, I can be a maniac too. <laughs> That's well, without a break. <laughs> Every time I use my sewing machine, I have to get out the owner's manual and look up how to use it. So I'm guessing you might be a little faster than some of us. That would be yeah. me. <laughs> Very inspiring to hear. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just thankful that you and, and all the other people out there are using your talents to, to help us with this. This is just a fantastic, uh, grassroots sewing movement we're seeing and I'm glad to uh, encourage it and be a part of it so thank you well thank you I um, I'm normally do costuming for local theater productions and Mamma Mia was supposed to open tonight so uh -huh. I filled the hole that was left by having to uh, suspend that production so we, given we're me glad your talents are still going to good use <laughs> Mamma Mia will be Apple Blossom's musical next year, though. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting us be a part of it. And uh, you all stay safe. And, uh, and uh, thanks again. We'll all get through this together. Thank you for your efforts. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your time, Dr. Lake and Dr. Wilson. We know you're very busy. And we want to thank you for all you're doing to keep our community safe. Um, I'm seeing the last few comments come through. Um, some are on Facebook, some are here in our chat um, about leaving an open channel in that nose bridge so you can slide in and out um, either those twist ties or the um, other, other things that might keep that nose bridge safe. And then when you launder them, that uh, eliminates the potential for rust. So that's a really great tip I wanted to share. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much for your time, um, for all you're doing for our community and, um, and for helping us through this um, difficult time. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.